Hello, good morning or good afternoon from wherever you are. Welcome to Partner Southeast Asia Arts and Culture Matters. My name is Camilia Harahap, or Kemi for short, and I am the head of arts in Indonesia, and I will be your MC for this session today. Over the next four days, we shall be taking you on a journey throughout Southeast Asia, exploring the arts and cultures of Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. We hope that this event will stimulate all your senses through the diversity of cultural expressions and practices found across the region. We intend to open your eyes to the array of opportunities that the region can offer, and that over the course of the next few days, you will be more knowledgeable on the region as a whole. We also hope that you can connect with your peers and counterparts through the various networking functions that the Hopin platform has to offer. I will go through the event program in more detail at the end of the session. However, in brief, we have five country briefing sessions and three thematic sessions, as well as a live networking session on the last day. In total, we have over 70 amazing speakers for you lined up. Focusing back to this opening session, we will have some opening remarks, a keynote speech, a panel discussion, and some closing reflections. But without wasting any more time, I would like to hand over to Caroline Meeby, Director Network Arts at the British Council, who will make the opening remarks. everyone it's lovely to be here and a very very warm welcome from a sunny but cold London to all our speakers and event participants we really appreciate that you've taken time out from your busy schedules to join us today this will be a really really exciting event and I have first of all have to say thank you to Kemi and all my colleagues who've worked really really hard for weeks and weeks and weeks now to put together this event. It is really, really exciting. Um, and I can't wait for you all to enjoy it. At British Council Arts, what we do is we find new ways of connecting with and understanding each other through the arts. And we do this to develop stronger creative sectors around the world that are better connected with the UK. So this is excitingly the very first time the British Council has organized an online event of this nature, where we're connecting UK arts and cultural practitioners with their counterparts from Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. As we all know, the arts and culture sectors globally have been hugely impacted by the effects of COVID-19 over the last 20 months. I think we've all really felt the loss of opportunities to meet face-to-face -face with international peers. 
Like most organizations, the British Council has had to adapt to new ways of working. Um, and that involved for us connecting virtually like this online event. So we're really excited that this event will provide a platform for you all to learn more about the arts and cultural sectors of the really, really vibrant Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia territories to exchange ideas and importantly, to interact and to meet other individuals and organizations that resonate with what you are doing. We're very, very keen to facilitate and make those connections possible. This is, of course, not the first time we've supported connections between the UK and Southeast Asia. In 2016, we ran a three-year programme called UK ID Festival, which planted the seeds for new relationships between the UK and Indonesian creatives. It's brilliant that these relationships have grown and they are still flourishing today. We're also really proud of the Southeast Asia Connections Through Culture Grant Programme, where we provide opportunities for UK and Southeast Asia creatives to work together on joint projects. We started this program in 2019, and since then we've supported over 100 international collaborations, spanning everything from research to residencies. So we very much hope that this event today and over the next few days will be the first of more events like this to come. At the British Council, we value the importance of supporting mutual and equitable artistic and creative collaborations. And we intend to continue this, whether in the virtual world or in person, or perhaps even a mix of both. Let's see where technology takes us in future. We encourage you all to actively participate, join the various networking opportunities provided through the event, be that one-to-one -one or in the breakout rooms, and lastly, please do share your experience and feedback of the event. Um, as we've said, this is the first time we've done this. So we really want to get everything that we, we really want to hear everything we can to make sure that future events are the best that they can be. Thank you so much and enjoy the event. Thank you, Caroline, for the opening remarks. We really appreciate that you joined us today. As you had already pointed out in your remarks, the Southeast Asia region is still experiencing travel restrictions as a result of COVID. And hence, we felt that this online event is the best way to stimulate new connections, whilst offering a good opportunity for those who would like to be reconnected until we are able to easily meet in person. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Duong Bik Heng, the Program Specialist and Chief of the Culture Unit at the UNESCO Bangkok office. Heng is an anthropologist with a strong commitment to gender equality, cultural diversity, and human rights. She is currently leading the Culture Unit at the UNESCO Bangkok office, covering the Mekong cluster countries and coordinating a number of regional projects in Asia and the Pacific. Her work involves supporting the countries to implement UNESCO's six cultural conventions and promoting the role of culture and creativity in sustainable development. Heng will be presenting a recent publication titled Backstage, Managing Creativity and the Arts in Southeast Asia, which draws on the findings of a recent study of the creative sector in the Southeast Asia region. All right, without further ado, I would like to bring you Heng, over to you.
Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be invited to this exciting event. Uh, thank you very much to British Council for this honor and also congratulations to everyone for putting together such an exciting uh, event. So as you know, the cultural and creative industry sector or what we often refer to CCI sector is seen as a driving force for economic growth in many countries in Southeast Asia. The countries in this region has a great diversity of culture and ethnicity, many creative talents, a growing middle class and a dynamic and youthful demography. The sector is currently facing a number of challenges, but we also see many signs of innovations and, motiv and motivation across the actors, and we are optimistic for a bright future. My presentation today is based on the findings from a study commissioned by UNESCO Bangkok in 2019 within the framework of the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. The study aimed to review and analyze the financial context of the CCI sector in Southeast Asia with a focus on sustainability of civil society organizations. In total, 322 organizations from nine Southeast Asian countries participate in the study, and the six of them uh, are joining this event uh, with you today. The graphs displayed in the screen offer an overview about the operation of the CCI organization surveyed. They work in a diverse range of domains. Many consider themselves multidisciplinary, Almost half of them operate with a very small budget, under $10,000 per year. A third had a deficit in the last three years, while a quarter operates without any business plans. The COVID pandemic undoubtedly has made the situation a lot more difficult than it was when we conducted this survey. In analyzing the operation of the CCI organizations in this region, we have found that the business model that an organization uh, follow has direct implication in terms of incentives and financing opportunities such as tax relief and the ability to apply for government or international grants. But many of the organizations surveyed in this study operate in a gray area. Around 30% of the survey organizations identified themselves as non-formal groups or collectives that's not officially recognized by the system. Some are incorporated as private for-profit companies while essentially earning little uh, or and functioning as non-profits. Others try to balance entrepreneurship with a social mission. Excessive bureaucratic government processes for the sector are key obstacles to the operations and sustainability of CCI organizations. Registration processes can be complicated and protracted, and the need to obtain permissions and permits in most countries adds to the administrative burdens of the CCI organizations. Government funding is inconsistent across the region. Some governments, such as Singapore, allocate significant funds towards CCI sector, while others, such as Cambodia, Laos, or Myanmar, offer little to no state support for the sector. Even where grants and funds are available, respondents and researchers reported that access to these, including access to information about them, was often difficult. International funding is a major form of support to the sector in some countries, particularly in the small and medium-sized economy countries. However, such funding is not always accessible due to specific registration requirements. While private patronage is key enabler for many CCI organizations in the region, corporate and individual philanthropic support for culture is still underdeveloped in all countries surveyed. Many organizations display a deficiency in strategic business planning skills and their market awareness tends to be low. Nearly a quarter of the organizations stated they had no business plans, professing to live from day to day, and 7% reported not knowing how to do business planning. Many CCI organizations rely greatly on a part-time or project-based labor pool, and control workers often subsidize their organization's activities through either free labor or very low wages. 
while surviving on income derived from other sources. Another common cited challenge is the difficulty of attracting and returning skilled personnel as salaries in the CCI sector tend not to be competitive. As the skills required in the creative industries are essentially transferable, staff often move out of the sector into related areas such as hospitality and tourism, which offer more sustainable and higher income. Many organizations reported not having enough staff trained in business and administrative skills. Cooperating with findings of the UNESCO Creative Economy Report 2013, which observed that capacity building within the creative economy sector was still in an experimental stage in developing regions. A more intractable challenge, however, may be the inadequate value placed on creative labor by the society, which affects not only the earning potential of creative workers, but also the overall market. The responses to the survey indicated that the domestic markets for control and creative goods and services are perceived to be weak. Most organizations depend greatly on expatriate and tourist purchasing power rather than their own local consumer. Even in countries like Singapore, where the appetite for arts and cultural events has grown significantly in recent decades, arts companies reported challenges in attracting ticket buyers and expanding their audiences. The art market is in significant competition with the entertainment industry and other lifestyle attractions, a factor that is expected to be exacerbated within the growth of digital content and globalization pressure on the industry. There is also a strong rural-urban divide. In most of the survey countries, CCI organizations were found to be engaging in education, cultural preservation, audience outreach, and sector capacity development, services that would normally be facilitated through government policy. This tends to be activities that cannot be scaled up as business propositions and cannot be supported by paying customers. The finding from the case study uh, from the survey, and the case study indicates four main factors that enable some CCI organizations to be more successful and sustainable than others. These factors are listed on the screen. It should be noted, however, that even the most successful organizations still struggle to survive. Compared to other surveyed countries, Singapore has the most extensive systems of government-funded support for the CCI organizations. Such support includes grants, incentive schemes, and tax exemptions. As a result of sustained state support over the past 20 years, the sector has become professionalized and a local audience has emerged for CCI organizations. Also, efforts are being made to promote Singapore's arts and culture internationally. Government policies that support the CCI sector have had positive results in other countries too including in Thailand, where a policy to promote the craft sector has enhanced the country's global reputation for high quality traditional crafts products. In Indonesia, the state agencies implemented various schemes and initiatives, and it is also introducing a system of tax exemption for CCI organization. Funding for CCIs remains a challenge, however, in low and medium economy countries where other needs tend to be perceived to be more urgent. The commitment of founders and patrons is essential to the running of many organizations. By many who are not getting paid by themselves and often act as investors, managing directors and advocates. This role can include providing business contacts, facilitating special rates for office rentals, and corporate and private sponsorship of events. The founder of CCI organizations often subsidize their operational costs uh, by not paying themselves and relying on income from other activities so as not able to pay staff and cover operational costs. In addition, they invest personal capital into the organization. Why organizations have been able to survive in this way Long-term sustainability may not be possible as CCI founders and owners may suffer burnout and financial difficulties. 
International organizations and diplomatic agencies such as British Council play a role in supporting CCI organizations by, by providing funding for vital activities, particularly in countries with less developed economies. CCI's organizations that are registered as non-government organizations are eligible to raise funds from international donors, but in countries where, where registration processes are complicated, bureaucratic or costly, many small and informal entities are excluded from international networks of support. The study found evidence of entrepreneurial spirit and practice among the survey organizations. Those that are found to be sustaining themselves often do so through a combination of their founders and members' resourcefulness, resilience, and a rootness in their respective cultural, creative communities and in a broader society. The social and cultural capitals of founders are a key personal is significant resource. In some cases, a community network is built through members of the collective contributing particular skill sets or areas of knowledge to keep the organization running. With 31% of the survey organization classified as collective and informal groups, this model appears to offer specific advantages for survival. In the region, uh, sorry. in the study, we have conducted in-depth interview with 29 organizations across the sub-region. Their work can be roughly categorized in the six areas. Education. For a number of years, independent organizations have been initiating their own capacity building activities to respond to the limited number of programs in the CCI. They include vocational education, short-term courses, and capacity building workshops. Such programs often depend on grants, sponsorships, and international support. However, a number of organizations also generate their own income by offering performances and services yes. or technical expertise in their field. The second area is advocacy and human rights. Human rights are commonly addressed within arts projects in Southeast Asia highlighting sensitive topics in creative ways, from women's rights to LGBTQ, freedom of speech to disability. Artists and creative communities have been pro promoting human rights with funding support from local and national institutions or individuals such as, as well as international bodies. Creative experiments, cross-disciplinary and experimental approaches are gaining momentum in the region. Legally, the possibilities are limited as social enterprise is not always formally recognized and NPO status can be difficult to obtain. Registering as private company or not registering at all becoming a common choice in this context. While they do not benefit from tax exemption when registered, in some cases, they are able to generate income to finance their own operations and activity. Heritage preservation and archiving require considerable resources to remain sustainable and relevant for the younger generation. From government funded programs to self-financed archives and privately sponsored spaces, Examples from the region show that the process of preserve, preserving culture is not necess, necessarily led by the governmental body, but can also be initiated by informal groups of passionate individuals. The understanding of arts and culture across diverse audiences is fundamental for the sustainability of artistic practices and the intellectual development in the region. Self-financed projects and volunteer networks have played a vital role toward art promotion and examination in Southeast Asia. Various models, including NPOs and commercial entities often behave as support hubs for the arts community. In the case of festival, dedicated leadership as well as, uh, and well-coordinated efforts are necessary to deliver international exposure and the accessibility to diverse artistic contents. Festivals and events in Southeast Asia strongly depend on informal networks and the development of a solid audience base, most often consolidated through private sponsorship and individual support. 
A few creative businesses from the private sector has managed to stay financially independent, generating enough income to carry out their activities, sometimes even making a profit. In some contexts, the generated income may be reinvested into social endeavors to benefit the local community. It can also be used to promote Southeast Asian artists overseas or focus on the development of creative capacity and professional skills. We met up with some of the organization in August to learn about their experiences during the pandemic. And they have shared with us some lessons that they have gained through this difficult period. Diversification, whether in regard to a CCI country of goods and services, future audiences, potential funding sources, alternative leadership structures, or composition of governing boards emerge as one of the most important methods for helping these organizations stay on their feet. Another lesson shared by our speakers was the need for CCI organizations to stay relevant. Despite the added financial challenges of the pandemic, organizations have also more than ever committed themselves to social advocacy issues, whether they are environmental, social welfare, or health. Many artists have turned to social work while they have had temporary shutter their art businesses during the pandemic. The connection to the communities has also been highlighted as something that encouraged organizations to persevere. They often use the words such as family, bond, and cooperation that lend to collegial relationships, a sense of cohesiveness and mutual connection. The message, we cannot do it alone, was heard repeatedly, loud and clear. All forms of support and collaboration will help these organizations to bounce back from this unusually difficult time and to sustain the organizations well into the future. Again, as before COVID, resilience, adaptability, and resourcefulness come back. These are the words that most characterize the CCI organizations and the creative sector in Southeast Asia as a whole. Based on these findings, we have generated a number of recommendations to further strengthen the CCI ecosystem in the region. Among these five recommendations, a few areas highlighted can shed light for the potential collaboration among the Southeast Asian and the UK creative sectors. First, this is the area of collaboration for co-learning to develop skills of artists and creative cultural workers. There will also be great needs for activities that contribute to audience development internationally, but also domestically. We are also very, very interested to see more opportunities to strengthen the collaboration across the uh, Southeast Asian countries, which I believe that British Council is already spearheading and leading very well in this region. And last but not least, since many collaborations often concentrate in national or regional capitals, there are a lot of potentials in smaller cities or even in rural areas at the subnational levels. The CCI organizations here are often in more disadvantaged positions and the opportunities for them to grow, to tap into a wider regional and international networks will not only assist them to sustainably grow, but also to narrow the rural urban divide and to ensure that development is more inclusive. So I invite everyone to come to visit our website where you will see the full publication and you can also contact us for further detail. Thank you very much again for listening. Thank you so much, Heng, for helping us to set the scene by providing some very useful insights on the arts and cultural sector in the region. I really encourage everyone to go to the Southeast Asia Pavilion space, which is on the left side of the Hopin platform and download the full report to gain even more knowledge on the region. Thank you once again to Heng for your presentation. Next, we have a panel discussion moderated by Angela Chan. Angela is the head of inclusion and doctoral researcher at Story Futures at Royal Holloway University, where she is applying her expertise in inclusive innovation to unlock the potential of creative businesses and promote underrepresented voices. She has worked across the UK television industry for over 20 years in documentary and commissioning roles. Most recently, she was the head of creative diversity for Channel 4. 
She currently sits on the British Council's Arts and Creative Economy Advisory Group and Nat West's Ethnicity Board and is an advisor for, for the Sir, Hen Sir Lenny Henry Center for Media Diversity. Angela will be in conversation with six panelists, three from the UK and three from Southeast Asia. I'll hand over to Angela Sood to provide more info on the discussion topic and the panelists. Welcome to this first panel of the conference. I'm Angela Chan and thank you Camilla for the very kind introduction. On today's panel we have a glittering cast of artists, academics and creative leaders from across the UK and Southeast Asia and we're going to be discussing the experience and the nature of international collaboration in the arts and how we can build sustainable creative industries through our collaboration. We're going to be talking about how we can make inclusive work under particularly challenging circumstances. Now we only have half an hour, so this is gonna be a whistle-stop tour of a range of the amazing work that the British Council has been supporting. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the panel and then ask them to tell you a little bit more about their work before we get into the discussion. So um, first of all, we have Farid Raccoon from Ruan Grupa Collective in Indonesia. We have Carol Sinclair, a former chair of Applied Arts Scotland, who's led on crafting futures and been the driving force there. Tarek Virani from the University of the West of England. We have Dr. Kemiga Terapong from the University of Bangkok, Thailand. And Ben Eason, Director of Invisible Flock, Digital Artist and Creative Technologist. And last but not least, Baby Ruth Villarama from Voice Studios in the Philippines. And um, could I ask Farid to, to briefly tell us a little bit about your work? So. Oh. Thank you very much, Angela. My name is Farid, Farid Rakun. I'm, uh, I have a lot of roles, but um, one that I can say maybe relating to this uh, session today is like I'm part of a collective, an artist collective, visual art collective called Ruang Rupa. Uh, and uh, 
while we're doing a lot of things, including maybe some of you would have heard uh, Documenta, uh, one of the biggest exhibition art, uh, in contemporary art world. Uh, we're, we're working with uh, a UK-based uh, art initiatives as well called Project Artworks from Hastings. And then from that, I think we can talk a lot about other things, including neuro neurodiversity, especially. Thank you. Thank you, Farid. Um, Carol, can I ask you to introduce yourself and your work? Yes, hello, good morning. Uh, lovely to be here. So yeah, my name is Carol Sinclair. I'm a ceramic artist, and I'm also a project manager with Applied Art Scotland. Um, I work here in Scotland and our work really has been with the Crafting Futures programme, as Angela mentioned, in Thailand, where we've been um, working with makers, artisans, and really helping to support both their creative and professional development. So that's that's me, very briefly. Thank you, Carol. Uh, now I'm going to ask Tarek Varani to introduce himself. Tarek. Thanks, Angela. Really happy to be here, everybody. Um, Tom Tarek Varani. I'm an associate professor of creative industries at uh, UE Bristol, University of the West of England, Bristol. Um, I've been doing work in the creative industries for a long time. With respect to the British Council, I worked on the Creative Hubs report in 2016. Um, I've recently run some some resilience workshops that Baby Ruth was was at one of them. Um, actually, at all of them. Um, and yeah, I've been I've been also working on the Creative Hubs Toolkit for the British Council as well. So doing, you know, lots of work with the British Council and really happy to be here again. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tarek. Uh, Kim, could I ask you to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Kemika Terapong. I'm a, my background actually a designer, but now I'm working as a researcher at Bangkok University. And uh, uh, my research area involves many areas like uh, participatory design, creative district, um, creative economy. And recently I work uh, with Ritty Council on a project called uh, Creative Aging. It's a research project uh, study about how um, aging people can enter or doing the creative works and that and their opportunity to be in a creative economy and creative industry. Thank you. Uh, ben? Good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Eaton. I'm a digital artist and I am the technical director of Invisible Flock. We're an interactive art studio based in the north of England at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park and also currently in residence for two years at the Wellcome Trust in central London. Uh, we're fervent believers in cross-disciplinarity and collaboration and sort of believe strongly in the role of artists as participants and direct actors in some of the most pressing issues that face us today, mainly the climate and ecological crisis, which is what our work focuses on almost entirely. And through British Council, we have numerous uh, long running, uh, deep and very important relationships to our practice in Indonesia, um, India, and also increasingly in Thailand as well. Thank you, Ben. And last but not least, uh, Baby Ruth. Hi, Angela. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, good day to everyone. My name is Baby Ruth, and I am a co-founder uh, of Voyage Film Studios. It's a group of independent storytellers based here in Manila that support Filipino and Asian voices through films, impact distribution, documentary screenings, film workshops, and especially international co-productions. Uh, I've been uh, a British Council baby since 2008, um, supporting their stories about climate change and, you know, I'm part of their pro some of their programs, uh, as, as Tarek mentioned, and now we're doing a program through um, connections through culture, and yeah, we're doing co-productions with British filmmakers at, at the other side of the world, so I'm happy to be here and share. Thanks, Baby Ruth. So, I mean, I hope you get a sense as an audience of the incredible range of work that the British Council's involved in supporting just from those brief introductions. But I want to come to the, the visual arts and craft practitioners first to ask why, why collaborate? What has the greatest benefit of international collaborations been for you? And how has that work or the connections made through the British Council affected your practice? Uh, perhaps I'll come to Farid first. Thank you, Angela. Uh, question of collaboration, uh, of course, comes very naturally to us, uh, collective from Indonesia. Maybe some of you knew already that uh, 
being a collective is kind of like a popular form of doing artistic and cultural and creative works here. So collaboration comes, as I said before, a collaboration comes naturally for us. Uh, what does it bring is actually kind of, uh, it's difficult to answer in a, a useful or growth-based uh, logic, but because we just like it, no? Uh, it's really nice for us, for me, to talk about us, not, not only for myself. Uh, and then in relation to British Council, I think like uh, there are a lot of possibilities because a lot of this funding, uh, soft diplomacy, all those kind of stuff, we are rethinking it as well uh, as I speak well, through a lot of practice. So, uh, in order for us to keep on doing what we're doing, and this is, I'm not only talking about Ruang Rupa, but a lot of this type of artistic and cultural practices that has been touched upon uh, today uh, to sustain not only financially, but also conceptually and idea-based, you know, like uh, how we can keep on doing what we're doing because we know a lot of our practice is actually very relevant to our local context, how to connect this locality. So instead of building an umbrella, a global umbrella that, that kind of like uni make everything uniform to connect these dots with, uh, with dotted lines even would be great. And collaboration, naturally trust building, all those kind of stuff uh, is something we fall into over and over again so far. Hopefully it's not answering your question. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to pick up on this idea of sustaining the creative industries. Carol, I know the work that you've done with Crafting Futures has been focused on sustainability in several senses. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, a, a bit like we just heard, I think collaboration is at the core of what Applied Arts Scotland does. We're a, a maker for maker organization. So, you know, everything that we do has collaboration, knowledge exchange and skills exchange at its core. So when we, we had the opportunity to work in Thailand with the British Council on a number of projects with Crafting Futures. And I think the main thing that it, it brings is, is innovation and new ways of thinking, you know, new ways of doing as well. And I, I think it's always a two-way process. And that's that's really important. I think that, you know, you you learn as much as you you offer in this kind of collaboration. There's, there's one example I would share where we were working with basket making communities in the conflict zones in the south of Thailand. And it was a, a wonderfully collaborative project with lots of partners and we worked with Thai designers um, to really help that community rethink how they made their products. Um, so, you know, they have really sort of traditional skills and traditional products that just didn't have a market. So together we were able to, to work with the community to do, to reinterpret the work, to express, you know, how they felt as a contemporary society. And it led, it was a really powerful project that led to a real increase in, in sales. So sustainability at that level, you know, of really looking at sustainable livelihoods, but also using sustainable local materials, which was really important. And I think too, that it was just so inspiring to see the increase in confidence, the increase in the body language changed as, as these, you know, sort of uh, collaborations took hold. And really importantly, it was an opportunity for that community to celebrate its identity, to really sort of feel proud of that and feel that it, it sort of, it brought together tradition and contemporary in a really uh, sustainable way, which was so inspiring. And I think that's where the international collaboration really comes in. It's, it's an opportunity to really think differently, to have a sort of mirror against your own practices and start to, to think differently about what you do. Um, to kind of really understand the connections. It's quite remarkable, you know, particularly when you're making, you have connections through your hands that you perhaps don't have through your language. Um, but also to then sort of understand a little bit more of the differences, 
and celebrate those differences, you know? So huge amount of learning, huge amount of inspiration and things that we've taken forward into other projects. You know, it's been really incredibly useful to, to build, um, you know, our, our sort of scope of other projects um, through the British Council Great. as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, I want to come to um, our academics, so your academic practitioners, of course, as well, but Kim and Tarek, I'm really interested in how this, um, uh, you know, how growing creative communities in this way leads to those benefits in the creative economy. I know that you've both been behind some of the creative hubs work that the British Council has been doing. What has your research found the benefits to be of working in this way? Perhaps I'll come to Kem first. Yeah, um, it's actually, so when we talking about collaboration, we, we tend to think about uh, the collaboration with, between individuals, like individual artists and individual craft makers, individual designers. So they share between them, like the techniques, material, and things that support each other. But in in my studies, uh, in my studies, both in the, the creative editing one and the creative district and creative hub ones, we found that it's it's become strengthened their ability and their opportunity when the collaboration is not only from individuals, but start from individuals and then going to communities, between individuals to communities and between communities and then between organizations. And then British Councils or other international organizations can bring out linking between different countries, sharing between different um, cultural aspect and cultural background or context. And that's the way, the way we learn from each other. And that is really important in my opinion. I see, so some of that British Council work can act as a catalyst. It might be a, a limited yeah. project, but actually the ripples outwards are, you know, they have a wider impact, right? Uh, yeah. Eric, what about your research? What have you found? Um, I mean, I just wanted to, to make a point of, you know, just on the back of what Kem was talking about, what's really important here is this idea of, of a global creative ecosystem. And I think um, UNESCO, um, it was Han who basically, who talked about that a little bit in the previous presentation. I think this idea of, of hubs as being anchors, especially local anchors for ecosystems is a really important point. And that's where my research really kind of focuses on this notion of moving between this idea of, of clustering um, or the agglomerative effects, I guess, of creative and cultural activity and how it benefits um, local areas and, and local communities. So creative hubs um, are vital to that because they, um, they anchor a very, very fluid sector. I mean, we all know that if you're part of the creative and cultural sector in any country in the world, you're sort of like, you're fluctuating between different types of organizational setups. You're a freelancer at the same time, you're running your own company at the same time, you're working with somebody else at the same time you're doing this. So that hustle sometimes needs to be sort of anchored or at least there needs to be a focal point. And I think um, hubs provide that really nicely vertically and horizontally. And actually you could think of the British Council as a bit of a hub as well, um, not a bit, actually a virtual hub on many levels, um, or at least that's something that you know to, to aspire to. The connections and the networks are vital, are, are important, and actually solidifying what those look like, the strength of those networks actually becomes becomes important as well. And that's where the agents come in to, to solidify that. So yeah, my research kind of fluctuates around that stuff. <laughs> really interesting, really interesting. Thank you both. So I want to come back to um, practitioners who've been leading some of these projects. Um, ben, I know the work that you've been doing has connected communities around themes like the environment and Baby Ruth, yours around the advantages and challenges of having a global documentary practice where you can bring in all those different voices. How has, how has the nature of that international collaboration changed for you over the past two years? Obviously, it's a really challenging environment. What have you been able to, to do to make those connections? Um, ben, I'll come to you first. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, we've initiated completely new relationships uh, right from the very beginning of, of sort of the pandemic that have carried on through. Um, so that's kind of what, like a year and a bit with people who we've never met in the flesh. Um, and we've made some, you know, some work that, that we're really pleased with and that is ongoing. And I think that's, that's really, that's really um, fantastic. And I mean, you know, I obviously don't want to say that it's a better or a worse thing because actually I don't think it's as simple as that. I think it purely makes 
us think differently about time and space and what bodies need to be in what place. And I think that's actually an incredibly valuable tool. I think there are ways that we can perhaps get even better at it as we develop a better literacy of communicating remotely and working remotely. And we discover or make tools for each other. That, that means that actually we can create collaborations that are international and that can last beyond the, the natural parameters of only being able to be in a country for a, for a week, for two weeks, or to have people over here, or, you know, and suddenly you can think about budgets differently and timescales differently and projects can take place simultaneously in multiple locations or can take place entirely online and I think you know that was always there but there's almost that thing of when you don't have a choice but working in that way it somehow legitimizes practices that perhaps are a bit more fringe or were a bit more on the edge and actually suddenly it legitimizes uh, these more uh, uh, less physically heavy but no less perhaps important works that can take place. And do you think it speeds on the, the kind of opportunities that open up in digital for artistic collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it can. I suppose I don't necessarily want to speak in like broad, broad strokes, but like, yeah, I, I think I think there's definitely the potential for it. I think um, I think it it. It, it perhaps just like can speed up some, I think it just lets us think a bit more loosely about how we interact and how we collaborate. And I think that's actually super valuable. I think, you know, the act of meeting face to face and working, and especially if you're in the business of making things and physical things or working with other people, there's nothing quite like being in the same space, especially if you're working around issues of landscape and ecology and stuff like that, then obviously not being entirely removed from those locations and each other is perhaps yeah. not how you do your best work, but but yeah, I think there's definitely a, a proximity that can now exist where perhaps there wasn't one before. And I think that's really valuable. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben, for that example. And Baby Ruth, more opportunities or challenges for you in the last couple of years as a result of these new ways of working? Well, I think uh, the main you know, change that happened to us as a production company making films is, is really the... the change in the entire process and how we do things. It's, it's really a 360 degree uh, turnover for us because, you know, um, you know we're, we're very physical in what we do. We go to a location, we film, but now with the pandemic, we're very restricted, you know, um, big time. So we had to really activate our network immensely. Um, we, we've been collaborating with filmmakers we haven't met in our entire life, but we're producing, you know, content and results, which is amazing. Um, we've, you know, now we've grown the network, you know, from being a Southeast Asian network here in the Philippines and few in Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, we've met filmmakers as far as Chennai, um, in the Middle East and Malaysia, you know, um, in even Indonesia. Um, so I think the frequency of digital conversation uh, has increased uh, at the same time. Uh, the, the crazy thing about it is, you know, we've joined this pact of World Wide Web where, you know, there's just so many things happening. Uh, so we, we don't know, you know, if we're reaching the, the target audience that we want. Um, so it's a constant challenge of impact distribution for us. So now we've been introduced to the idea of impact distribution and we've um, rearranged our goals. So not, um, before we used to have one goal uh, to produce films and to deliver it, to broadcast it, that's it. But now we've rearranged and we realize that, you know, there are short term goals medium term goals and long term goals and for me that that's really more important and to make sure that the voices of the people that we are representing to our stories you know are reaching the proper uh, audience that they want to speak to so those are you know some of the adjustments that we had to uh, yeah adapt very interesting and I, I think the point you make about audience is is really valid you know we're often thinking about the process of making the work but i want to come back to farid uh, briefly because I was just getting warmed up when I came to you before. In this thing about audience, you know, do you, do you feel those international collaborations have allowed you to not just reach a different audience, but reach an audience differently? You know, how, how have they enabled you to make different sorts of work or, or speak in, in a different way with different, uh, surfacing different voices? Uh, different contexts for sure. Uh learning from because this is how we work uh, by understanding the context we're working in uh, a lot of times our responsibility of course is Jakarta first and then Indonesia second Southeast Asia third you know like keep on going but uh, if we're forced every time we're forced to face a new context 
then it's kind of like our ecosystem got enlarged although it's still temporarily no matter how temporarily it is but it's kind of like a good waking up call every time so things that we took for granted like uh to waste time towards each other for each other all those kind of stuff that we thought it's kind of like natural for a lot of us it's actually kind of like difficult to practice in any other context just citing one very blatant example but because of that we're kind of like uh, honing and sharpening our sensibilities because of those challenges every time It's interesting. So there's sort of efficiencies that come through these ways of working as well. It's a terrible word to apply to arts in a way, isn't it? Um, I'm really curious with this shift to digital. You know, I know that one of the themes of the conference is inclusion. Have any of you noticed the, um, obviously there's opportunities, but are there new forms of inequality that spring up um, through that shift to digital? Kem, you've been working with um, older people, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. You, what do you, how do you do you feel that you have to somehow balance out um, what kind of work you do around you know with the shift to digital? Actually, the older people they really like to engage in digital world. You know, like it's really in that way. Because uh, I have one one case that uh, they do like uh, train the older people to use um, social media network and to train them to be YouTuber, to turn them to be the content creator or photographer. And, you know, uh, exhibit um, their works online. They are digital artists because of um, influence from, 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 from the people, like younger people. So they can do as well. So they, they really like to go, but if, if to go online, but if they, don't have up that opportunity to learn or to train is is still difficult but in 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 that study they in, increasing the number of the, the aging that enter to the to the digital world recently Thank you. yeah Thank yeah and uh, Tarek, i know you have thoughts on this as well more on through the shift to digital yeah um Coming at it from, I guess, uh, the creative hubs perspective as well, I guess there's, there's been a lot of challenges around digital haves and have nots. And I think going back to what Han was saying as well about the sort of urban to rural divide in, in Southeast Asia, which throwing up a problem as well. I mean, even in the UK, we, we know that there are digital problems in, you know, it's really difficult to get a, a signal, you know, if you're out in the, in the countryside or whatever it is. So there is there are challenges there. I think they're quite infrastructural. Um, but then there's a whole there's a whole slew of other things as well that need to and I'm sure in this decade will you know, we'll iron these out, you know, this, we, I think things are going to look very different by 2030 than they do now based on the fact that we're, you know, we're moving, shifting everything to digital. But yeah, right now, I think there are challenges, there are infrastructure issues, other parts of the world have, it's, it's a huge cost to get online as well. So that's an added cost to actually running your own creative and cultural organization as well. So some of the challenges are infrastructural as much as anything about being able to provide data and not making assumptions. Uh, ben, sorry, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I was going to say, yeah, just to Tarek's point, which I think is 100% correct. I mean, hilariously, our studio runs off a 4G dongle because we can't get uh, broadband where our studio is in, in the UK. But I think also there's, there's like, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's a diversity of digital cultures as well. And I think, you know, the digital arts in the UK, not to paint too broad a picture, but are often very focused on ideas of innovation and innovation often means newer shiny bigger and I think there are very uh, fascinating emergent digital cultures that exist in other parts of the world which do not necessarily prioritize um, that sort of attitude towards technology and instead think of technology in much more fascinating ways and I think that was certainly our experience of Indonesia when we first went and so I think there's also a digital diversity which is the risk that you apply a single digital aesthetic which is like a western American platform driven one onto cultures where perhaps actually ways of thinking about digital is very different. Can I add to, can I add to that really quickly I mean it's such a such an important point Ben. Um, quick example um, a couple of years ago I was involved in a project in China where they were basically they craft makers had cameras within their in their rooms to actually show 
um, audience, I guess, people that were, that were sort of tuning in, um, how they were making the things that they were making, and they were selling them in real time. Um, just, just this idea of a collective kind of way to approach audience creation and, you know, sort of skills and individualization as well as it comes, as it pertains to the internet. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, all over the world, it's, it's different, you know, in other parts of the world. And it's something that we can definitely learn from in the UK, for sure. Anyone else want to feed in on that point? Carol? Yeah, I think we were, we were sort of ahead of the curve slightly in that we were creating a digital version of our sort of in-person workshops um, and created a craft toolkit a couple of years ago. And we had some in-person training in Bangkok to launch the toolkit. And, and it was really interesting. I agree what, what Kimmy was saying about older people were very excited to be part of that world. And I think that's one of the things that we have to do is just gently introduce people and say it's just another tool in the toolkit. It's not, a, you know, it, it, it opens up worlds and it certainly opens up connections. Um, and I think makers, particularly when they are used to doing things with their hands, they've perhaps been a little bit more reluctant. So if we can introduce people very gently to the digital world, I think it, it makes them feel included and excited. You know, so I think we should we should continue. And we've been really lucky that we've now, through British Council support, been able to translate our toolkit into Indonesian and Malay. So we're opening up those worlds of interconnectivity uh, day by day and adding a sustainability module to it that will be launched next year. So just an opportunity for a quick plug there. Brilliant. <laughs> um, Brilliant. I'm interested, um, sorry, who was, I missed who was speaking. No. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add uh, one of the things that we uh, realize as well in this, you know, new normal, as we say, is, is really the educational sector. And uh, I have to give credit to the British Council, you know, uh, when we were uh, supposedly organizing a documentary festival, a physical festival, and then the pandemic hit us, uh, we realized that, you know, the blended education, when, when students trans, uh, transported their ways of you know learning uh, to digital. Uh, there's a, a new audience for 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 films you know to to be consumed uh, for educational use, and the digital platform really uh, helped the educational sector. And through the network of the British Council, uh, they were able to connect the documentaries to the educational sector. And now uh, documentaries are slowly infusing their way into the curriculum. Uh, at least here in the Philippines. And I know that there is a group there in the UK that we've just met recently that does documentaries, short documentaries uh, for digital use uh, in education as well. So that, those are one of the things that, you know, that uh, change the way we do things, uh, at least here in, in the Philippines. Brilliant, thank you. Now, sadly, we're gonna to have to bring us to the close. I could literally listen to you all, all day. Would anybody like to bring us out by just saying what they feel the most important thing about that sort of British Council support has been? What would you say to anybody listening who's thinking about getting involved? I'd just like to say that working with the British Council oh, takes you absolutely... Oh, sorry. I was just, just going to say that I, I think working with the British Council is such a privilege because it takes you right to the heart of the community that you need to reach. It's really efficient way of working. It's really inspirational. And there's just no way to, to make those connections without your, you know, sort of British Council colleagues and their knowledge and expertise. One of our colleagues from Southeast Asia or South UK? Farid or Baby Ruth? What's the value um, for you? What would you recommend for other people? I think it, it's really, you know, the way, you know, people are gathered together like this event um, and it, it really up the ante for everyone, you know, um, uh, at least in terms of doing our practices uh, we get to learn at the same time, we get to offer our voices and, you know, we, we, we get to uh, yeah, see the standards where we're going and define, you know, the, the road uh, for the next, I guess, three to five years, you know, through these exchanges that we're doing right now. And British Council is at the heart of that, uh, at least for us, because, you know, um, we, you know we, we, we've stormed uh, every phases uh, in terms of risk uh, that we've, we've gone through, the climate change uh, programs that we've experienced, sports, and now, you know, we, we are embracing the digital world. And I'm just thankful that, um, yeah, uh, filmmakers, at least here in Southeast Asia, are learning, you know, with our counterparts there in the UK and in other parts of the world. Okay, it's going to break my heart. I'm going to bring it to a close. Thank you all so much for your contribution. And I hope those of you in the audience will have a chance to meet some of these 
wonderful panelists in the networking sessions. Thank you for your time and your contribution. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much to Angela and all the panelists for joining us and sharing your rich experiences, of, as well as, of, of course, the international collaboration aspects. We are so sure that you have inspired and motivated our audiences to consider international collaborations, as well as the benefits that they can bring. Further, our last speaker for this session will be Hugh Moffat. Hugh is the country director of Indonesia and the Southeast Asia cluster lead. Hugh joined the Indonesia team in 2020 and due to COVID has only actually been in Jakarta since earlier this year. Hugh has also been at the British Council for over 20 years. And prior to Indonesia, he had lived in the UK, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa. I would like to invite Hugh to make some reflections on the session and about his time in Indonesia so far. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much uh, to, well, to the amazing array of panelists and speakers that we've had today, starting out with Kenny, our great facilitator, thank you, Kenny, but also to Caroline, who set the tone explaining the British Council's interest and, and the focus that we have on arts and culture within Southeast Asia. Um, we heard uh, from, from uh, Don Bit Han uh, from, that, uh, from that presentation, and we also had an incredible panel uh, facilitated by Angela. I'm not sure how you managed to cover quite so much in such a short space of time with uh, Tariq, Farid, Carol, Ben, Baby Ruth and Ken, but it's given quite a lot to consider as I try and summarize, uh, and I'm not going to try and summarize, I'm going to try and pick out a few words from first the, the, the plenary that we heard from uh, Donald Bithan, but also from, from the discussions that we heard. But I think the, the important points that, well, so many important points come through when we talk about uh, the arts and the culture within the context, of course, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and that came through very clearly uh, with Don Bithan's presentation, where towards the end, as I say, she highlighted that we cannot do it alone. The impact uh, of, of, uh, of the pandemic has meant that people have adapted. Uh, and that, that point she made about the diversification of organizations. And so many of these CCI organizations, as she described them, very small scale, small businesses, uh, single owners, in the individuals who put their own money in to keep it going, yet diversifying their products and services and, and arts work uh, is, is something that she particularly highlights. But she also focused on the fact that the importance of the creative sector to the economy, particularly in Southeast Asia, 
And we hear that again and again, as I'm here in Indonesia, I find myself on panels and discussions about how the creative economy and tourism will contribute to building back the economy better in this part of the world. And we know that's certainly a focus for Indonesia as it takes on G20 status next year. So it's great to see that con context. But of course, the other challenge is the fact that that regulatory landscape for those organizations that work on social, environmental, creative side, and how do you then get that noise, get that voice, get that recognition uh, within the context of business and, and economy. It's a really important sector, but sometimes we need to be championing that. That's what we do uh, in all our different roles, and we all have a role to play on that. So I think that gave the context then for the panel discussion and how on earth to summarize. But I do like the starting point that we had with the Angela's asked first question, which is why collaborate? And again, I think that response was because we like it, I think is probably answers everything. We like to collaborate. But the point being that within the creative sector, you know, it's a it's a natural, it's our core, it's our way of working. And I think that point around connecting the dots here is we have a lot of small organizations. How do we make more noise about the impact these organizations have on our culture, on our economy? and on international relations. They are so important to, and they are the fabric of our society. And these conversations bring it through. And we heard about that focus of, we really need to draw that global ecosystem forward to, to highlight and, and champion the cause to show that these organizations, these individuals working are contributing so significantly. And how can organ other governments and how can non-government organizations work together to support those individuals who are working in community and are engaging and creating opportunities for so many more. So those connecting the dots and uh, those dotted lines are a global ecosystem with hubs playing a role that can anchor the hustle. There you go. I like that one. I thought that was a really good phrase that we've got so much there that we can work with in, in the sector. Um, and again, of course, in the context of digital, where you can quite see that, that we talked about the digital haves and have nots. Um, but at the same time, that sense of, in some cases, introducing people very gently to a digital world, crafts, crafts and artists who may not normally do so. But we've had to do things differently, and we've demonstrated that we are able to do so. So, so many things there that we, we picked from those conversations, lots of what we can carry on with, and, and that's the purpose of the next few days. It's to say that the opportunities are there for more engagement and collaboration. And from a British Council perspective, the context for us is fantastic. Southeast Asia is a priority for the UK. Uh, we've just had Liz Truss here, uh, who's the Foreign Secretary for the UK, visiting Thailand, Indonesia, uh, and Malaysia. And just so you know, she visited a creative hub in West Java, which can be facilitated here. And within that context, we were able to demonstrate why and how and so how important it is to be talking about the creative economy as we look to phrases such as build back better or uh, economic recovery, how the role of the arts plays that role. And of course, strongly supported by the governor of West Java, Widwan Kamil, who's obviously uh, an architect and a creative himself. So fantastic to have that. And we had Tita Larasati uh, able to articulate some of the work that the uh, policy and evidence uh, group who've been working on the research they've been doing on the importance of the creative economy. So we're gonna hear lots more of that in the next few days. But the main point for me to say is, this is about the role of connecting you together with the Southeast Asia. That's what we do. We strengthen connections between the UK and these countries and across ASEAN, as we've heard. Um, and the, per the point is, this is an opportunity that we'd like to see much more uh, of, and we see that there are opportunities coming up. So we hope that the networking opportunities you have coming in the next few days will allow you to see what others are doing and inspire you to then come to us for new ideas and find new ways of working together. So enjoy the event, uh, enjoy the rest of the week, and back to Kemi, uh, who will take us through for, for the next few days. Thank you so much.